Good afternoon and welcome to this Book at Lunchtime event on Greek Weird Wave, a cinema of biopolitics by Professor Dimitris Papanikolaou. My name is Maria del Pilar Blanco and I'm the academic champion for networks and partnerships at Torch. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Papanikolaou today to speak about his book. Also on the panel are Dr. Karolina Watroba and Dr. Alexis Radisoglu. Greek Weird New Wave, a cinema of biopolitics, proposes that Greek Weird Wave um, is a paradigmatic cinematic moment, which points to a much larger development of biopolitical realism in world cinema. The book establishes a cinematic and cultural history of Greece during the last very difficult decade, focusing on key films from the post-2009 new and weird wave of Greek cinema that represent, reframe, and reimagine the present. In a moment, I will hand over to Dr. Alexis Radisoglu, uh, who will fully introduce the book and the rest of the panel. This will be followed by a brief reading by Professor Papanikolaou, and afterwards, our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their different disciplines. We will then give Professor Papanikolaou the chance to respond to some of the points raised before entering into what promises to be a really fascinating discussion. The event will then conclude with questions from you, the audience, so please pop those over. It's a great pleasure to be here to introduce the second Book at Lunchtime of this term. Book at Lunchtime is Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book, uh, book discussions with a range of commentators. Please do take a look at our website and also our newsletter for the full program for this term. So all that's left for me to do now is to thank you all for being here, for coming, and also I'm going to introduce our chair. Dr. Alexis Radisoglu is Assistant Professor in German Studies in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at Durham University. His research interests are in the field of 20th century and contemporary literature, film, and visual culture, with a particular focus on comparative, transcultural, and interdisciplinary forms of inquiry. He is currently working on two research projects titled, respectively, Post-Global Aesthetics and Eurozones, Literary Imaginaries of Contemporary Europe. His most recent article, just published in the Modern Languages Review, examines narratives of European crisis through the lens of contemporary Greek and German fiction. So over to you, Alexis. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to introduce our uh, two speakers today. Uh, first, the author of the book, of course, Professor Dimitris Papanikolaou, who is an associate professor in uh, modern Greek and a fellow of St. Cross College here at the University of Oxford. His uh, research focuses on the ways modern Greek uh, literature opens a dialogue with other cultural forms, especially Greek popular culture, as well as with other literatures and cultures. And uh, the other important strand of his research focuses on queer theory, the history of Greek queer cultures, and the difference they can make in people's lives and social movements. And all of that, of course, is uh, abundantly evident, I think, in the book uh, we will be discussing today. Um, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Karolina Vatrova, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in modern languages at All Souls College, also here at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on modern literature and film across eight European languages and beyond, um, with a particular focus on material in German, English, and Polish. And her forthcoming book, Man's Magic Mountain, World Literature and Closer Reading, is the first academic study of Thomas Mann's landmark Germanist no novel Der Zauberberg, The Magic Mountain, that takes as its starting point the interest in Mann's book shown by non-academic readers. Um, so here as well, uh, um, an interest in uh, a form of academic research that goes beyond the academic sphere alone. I would propose that Dimitris uh, starts now with a reading uh, from his book, Greek Weird Wave, a cinema of biopolitics uh, that has come out recently from Edinburgh University Press. Dimitris, well, over to you. First of all, a thank you to all of you who have come um, um, here today and also to those who are going to watch this and uh, to everybody who has been involved in organizing this, to Torch, of course. This has been a, a, a book long way in the making. Uh, it actually starts with... Um, uh, the films of Lanthimos, Tagari, Kutras, and others being so much noticed 
after 2009 in the international fora, we suddenly realized something was happening there. At the same time as um, Greece, a country uh, which, um, from which I come, a, ca a country which I research, um, I'm in constant dialogue uh, with uh, whatever happens in there. At the same time then uh, that Greece was undergoing what became known as the Greek crisis. Um, so it is a book that is, uh, was being written as things were evol evolving and as uh, particular films were touching me in different ways. I, I'm trying to, to describe this in the book. I will only read uh, the first two pages of the, um, how the acknowledgements actually start. You will see that the book itself tries to emulate uh, the various stages um, that it came to be written alongside uh, kind of famous directors. Uh, you can also find uh, directors who have only ha uh, done short films or younger directors. Anyway, here is how the book starts. A few pages later, you will find a scene that I have now come to realize could be used as a key to understand this book as a whole. It is 2016, and Yorgos Zois, a Greek director who is taking some notice internationally, is giving an interview to Arte, the French-German art TV channel. The new wave of Greek cinema produces films that are as absurd as the financial crisis that has hit the country, begins the journalist. Welcome to Athens, the capital of Greece, the supposed weakest link of Europe. As Zoïs's work came to international attention for its relationship precisely to the socio-political situation that in recent years has come to be known as the Greek crisis, capital G, capital C, all over the world, he is now asked to speak about uh, a controversial scene that he has directed in which a young man is seen throwing a lot of cocktail in an almost choreographed manner. While they were shooting, so Zois says, there was a real demonstration happening in the background. And then comes the question from the journalist. And you used a real Molotov cocktail? The director stops for a moment and looks at the camera, then laughs. He seems to have found the question very awkward, which it is. Well, no, of course not. Uh, it was fake. When we are shooting something, well, it is a fake Molotov that we use. So much in this scene, including the absurdity of the question you use the real Molotov cocktail, speaks to the questions that serve as a starting point for this book. What did an international and national audience expect from Greek cinema during this recent turbulent period? How did it deliver? How can you make films with such expectations, but also in that socio-political context? How real should you be? How realist? And also, how strange, how weird is it to be thrown into a predefined role, like the director here, and then to try, like Zoe's in this interview, to both stay on script, but also to showcase the levels of absurdity that that script has already reached. The Greek weird wave, celebrated internationally after 2010, has been a national cinema movement that is not so much defined by the answers it might give to these questions, but by the questions themselves. From the outset, it was seen as the cinematic response to the Greek crisis, sometimes in spite of the films themselves or their directors. It offered international circulation and production options to many Greek fiction films, this has to be said, although it has not altered the financial and institutional precarity of Greek cinema as a whole. It became an easy reference point internationally, especially after the huge international success of Yorgos Lanthimos. Yet it also remained contested as a wave, as a term, weird wave, all its films were seen and treated as a closely related group, judging by their national and international reception, but why, what unites them remains difficult to pinpoint. One thing that surely brings these films together, so my book argues, is a culture of late capitalism, biopolitics and crisis neoliberalism, in which they participate and which they often thematize. 
The analytical insights into biopolitics, as reformulated by Michel Foucault, become crucial for the argument in the book as they focus on the management of human life from the large scale of a population, its categorization, its health, livability, and or prescription, to the minutiae of human body, its functions, and the ways in which it interiorizes power and knowledge. Accordingly, a framework of biopolitical realism not only shows how the films of the Greek weird wave relate to each other, but it also allows viewers, and of course critical interventions, this book included, to appreciate and work with their political potential. The Greek weird wave is today not the only cinema of biopolitics, but it is certainly a paradigmatic one. And this is what the following pages, the book as a whole, set out to show. The final draft of my book, and this is the point I want to finish with, was being reread while the whole world entered the biopolitically most acute period in recent history with the global COVID-19 emergency, the lockdowns and the world health and economic challenges that ensued. Suddenly, everyone started talking about biopolitics. To the researcher in modern Greek studies, this might feel like a déjà vu. There was a time after 2010 when, in a similar way, you could find the world biopolitics everywhere in Greece. And so much I was taken by this fact, I had to re uh, finish the book during lockdown, uh, that I returned to this point later in the book. And this is what I have to say about this. As I'm working on the final edits of this text, most countries around the world have imposed lockdowns in order to manage the spread of COVID-19. The whole world remains at a standstill with populations listening every day to announcements about national and global health measures, making it difficult to deny that this is an intense biopolitical present par excellence. Having said that, I would argue that the biopolitical excess of the global coronavirus crisis does not take anything away from the slower and perhaps deeper development of the governmentalities of the post-2008 global and, of course, Greek financial crisis. Indeed, obsessed with the focus of my studies, of my study as I write and watch from my balcony the empty streets of Athens in March 2020, I'm constantly reminded of the many Greek films that, in the last decade, have been showing the individual locked indoors or walking through deserted or semi-deserted urban landscapes. Attenberg, Dogtooth, Alps, Park, L, Boy Eating the Bird's Food, P.T., Third Kind, and so on. All these films were not prefiguring anything, nor were they describing life during a total lockdown. What they were doing was trying to think through, think through a prolonged period when the politics on, over, and off life take precedence. They seem to have sensed that the way to visualize the intertwinement of politics and life, of the body and of the individual and the population, is to show life ordered, 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 and sometimes ordered to be elsewhere. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, thank you for this uh, very suggestive passage, which I think is also a reminder of the, some of the many ways in which this is a, a, a prescient book, uh, really, um, that talks to this uh, particular kind of social, historical, and, and political moment in, in time. Um, uh, many thanks, uh, Dimitri. Many thanks, uh, Maria. Um, I, I want to start really by, by saying how delighted I am to be here today. Um, people here in the room and, and, and many in the audience will know that I was a part of Dimitris' very first cohort of undergraduate students when he first arrived in Oxford. Um, so th the fact, I think, that, that this period uh, sort of precedes the gestation of this book, um, precedes, in fact, any concrete manifestations of what we um, have come habitually to call the, the Greek crisis also says something uh, nice, I think, about a relationship um, that has had a 
profound influence, I have to say, on my, on my own decision to pursue an academic career um, and on the ways in which I, I started to and have continued to think about texts and about literary criticism uh, uh, and about the politics of all of that. Um, which is really another way of saying that Dimitris' work touches people, uh, moves them, uh, shapes them and their, and their way of looking at things. It, it is animated and has always been um, by an, an infectious joy and, and passion for what we do uh, and, a, and a compelling enthusiasm for why it matters. And um, that's as true, I think, for those undergraduate tutorials, uh, not quite, but almost incredibly 20 years ago, um, as it is uh, for this uh, present book. So true as much for his teaching as uh, for his uh, research and, and public engagement, really. Um, my, my remarks today will be concerned with the question um, of, a, of a political aesthetic more broadly, and with two aspects of the book in particular that I found very interesting and, and illuminating. Um, the first has to do with the extraordinary subtle and, and, and multifaceted and indeed hopeful and politically enabling way in which uh, Dimitris addresses the question of a, a realism of the weird, uh, or a weird realism perhaps, or, or what Dimitris probably would call the, the biopolitical realism of uh, the weird. And uh, the second somewhat interrelated point will have to do with what I would like to call a political epistemology attendant to the category of the weird, um, and with the ways in particular in which such an epistemology is tied, on the one hand, to a properly global socio-historical juncture, um, that does not, however, on the other hand, randomly emerge out of the specific locality of Greece or the European, perhaps even global South more broadly. Um, it is worth remembering then that one of Dimitris' key interlocutors in this book is very explicitly uh, the late cultural critic Mark Fisher. Um, Fisher has, if not coined, then at least popularized and made influential the notion of a capitalist realism, which for Fisher signifies the widespread sense, and I'm quoting here, that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it, something like a pervasive atmosphere, to quote Fisher again, acting as a kind of invisible barrier constraining thought and action, or even perhaps a form of reflexive impotence, as Fisher calls it. So realism here has to do with a decisive narrowing of historical possibilities with a foreclosure of transformative political praxis. It stands, one could say, in a mimetic relationship to the global predicament of neoliberal hegemony. And Dimitris, on the one hand, accepts this diagnosis, exacerbates it, in fact, and we'll have time to talk about that in much more detail, by biopoliticizing it, rooting it in what he calls our intense biopolitical present, something, as he writes, that is not a global, recognizable power of oppression, but an over-expansive and dominant logic of governance, one that we have heard uh, sort of trickles down to the minutiae of uh, the very body itself. But realism, of course, never operates in the domain of the mimetic alone. It is also part of the performative terrain of poiesis. And this is where Dimitris' account of realism through a meticulous close reading of the very form of the films he analyzes, of instances of a performative excess in them, often associated with the figure of metonymy, turns gears and makes realism into something altogether more hopeful and future-oriented. Realism becomes the site not only of a representation of how things supposedly are, but of a form of disarticulation, rearticulation, assemblage, something able to locate the sutures in what Kara Keeling would call the quotidian violence of our intense biopolitical present, the moment of queerness, really, that attends, in Keeling's words, to that dimension of the unpredictable and the unknowable in time that governs errant, eccentric, promiscuous, 
and unexpected organizations of social life. I was also reminded here by a quote by that most influential theorist of the poetics of realism, Brecht, who said at one point that for a living and combative realism, which is fully engaged with reality and fully grasps reality, it is not only imperative, in Brecht's words, to keep step with the rapid development of reality, but also to construct something, something artificial, as Brecht calls it, posed. What we therefore equally need, Brecht concludes, is art. Could he equally have said, I was wondering as I was re reading Dimitris' analyses of the construction of the self-conscious artificialness and posedness of these films, what we therefore equally need is the weird. I want to conclude here then by quickly raising one more issue. Um, the critic Buaventura de Sousa Sanche, author among other words of The End of the Cognitive Empire, The Coming Age of Epistemologies of the South, has written in this latter book that dominant politics becomes epistemological when it is able to make a credible claim that the only valid knowledge available is the one that ratifies its own dominance. This means, therefore, and I quote Sanchez again, that the reconstruction or reinvention of confrontational politics requires an epistemological transformation, not alternatives, but an alternative thinking of alternatives. If Dimitris's book engages, succeeds even, in such an alternative thinking of alternatives, then could we say that the kernel of the transformed epistemologies on which such an alternative thinking is predicated can be located, once again, in the category of the weird itself? And would, in that sense, the weird, as it manifests itself in these films from Greece, a country in the European, perhaps even the global South, be able to emerge suddenly as something like the harbinger of a veritable epistemology of the South? It is a question, I believe, that very forcefully emerges from this book and that turns this very closely observed local case study in the discipline of modern Greek into something of very immediate and global import. And that brings us to Carolina. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Dimitris, for inviting me. Um, I did not have the pleasure of being taught by you for so many years as Alexis, but I do remember our seminars on cultural studies still very well. Um, and um, I should say from the beginning that I am not a specialist on Greek culture, um, but I am a comparatist who's always on the lookout for interesting sort of rich case studies that I could use in my own research. So it was a it was great to read your book because it really is such a rich case study that I think many of us um, not working on Greek culture can, can still engage with. Um, so in my remarks, I would like to focus on three aspects that I think are really productive for, uh, for us comparatists. Um, and at the end, I will also formulate some, some questions to do with that. Um, so the first aspect is the relationship of your book to reception studies um, or the study of reception. So how cultural products interact with the wider world and how they change and evolve as they are received by readers or in your case viewers. Um, and what struck me immediately about even your really starting point or premise is this is sort of a dream case study for somebody interested in reception because it it really proves the mantra of reception studies, which is that you cannot disentangle reception and production. Uh, and in fact, you say from the beginning in the book that in the case um, of the Greek cinema of the last decade, really reception or certain expectations about reception really came before production. Um, so you say very explicitly that those directors making those films knew that they would be received in the context of the Greek financial crisis. And this really altered the, from the beginning, what those films became. Um, and, and and you talk about it eloquently just throughout the book. You, you show this um, in all of the Greek films that you discuss. And the one film that maybe is stuff to an English-speaking audience the most uh, recognizable, The Lobster, you even show it there um, in really interesting ways. Um, 
And, and really once I started sort of reading the book, thinking about, you know, mining it for good examples for how reception works, uh, there are so many great examples, but I think my favorite comes in the epilogue where you talk about a film I haven't yet watched, but will do so immediately, Winona, um, and, the, and the scene where the, the main characters want to sing an, an Ellie hit by Madonna, but cannot do it sort of because of copyright. And, and this, you know, this is both thematized in the film and I suspect was also just a condition of the production of the film. They just couldn't afford to have the copyright to include the, the, the tune or the lyrics. And you sort of reproduce this moment in your book marvelously where you just have sort of dot, 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 dot instead of the lyrics. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it sounds like a wonderful scene, but also I think its significance is much deeper and, it's, and, it, and it sort of captures something about your book about your more general argument, which is the sort of the, the impact of the sort of capitalist flow of finance on the very aesthetics of this cinematic moment. Um, and, and this leads me to my second point, which is about the relationship between what you refer to as small nations and the, and the larger framework of world cinema. Um, and this is also something that interests me a lot. And I think this, the, the, the examples that you give here can be really useful for everybody interested in this sort of fraud relationship between the so-called small nations and sort of bigger, more hegemonic cultures and also those global frameworks of reception for which world cinema is one um, sort of handy um, term. Um, and, and this moment with the, with the Madonna lyrics, I think, captures exactly that sort of difficult relationship, right? How the culture of a small nation is never just the culture of a small nation. It, it's a very international culture, and very often not by choice, but, but just as a result of those very, um, those very real political um, environment that, that small nations find themselves sort of exposed to, whether they want to or not. Um, and, and this brings me to my third point, which is specifically about Germany. Um, I am based at the German sub-faculty, so is Alexis, in fact. Um, so perhaps that's why I'm so attuned to it, but um, it, it really seemed to me that there's sort of like a spectral presence of German culture in this book. Um, and I think the language of spectrality actually is quite close really to what you do in the book, that, that's why I'm allowing myself to say that. Um, there's many examples of this, I think. Um, the role of German financial ins institutions in the Greek crisis, you don't really thematize it very much, but I think it's in the back of every reader's mind. Um, what you talk more about is the mediation of the Greek weird wave through international institutions, of which one particular one that you highlight is this um, TV channel Arte, which is a Franco-German TV channel. Mm. Um, another example of this, I think, in the very vocabulary that you use, whenever you sort of try to define or engage with this term weird, there are other sort of similar critical categories in the background, both in Mark Fisher's work, but also in, in, in your own writing eerie, unhomely, and really unhomely is a translation of unheimlich, right? And is perhaps the most, out of the terms that somehow are in conversation with weird, that's probably the one of the most cultural cachet. Um, so I think because of all of that, and I have more examples that we can talk about later, because of all of that, it is perhaps dare I say eerily, uncannily appropriate that both of us, <laughs> the respondents, are actually from, uh, from faculties of German studies. Um, and the reason why I think this is, uh, again, actually, maybe not addressed in the book, it's sort of directly, explicitly, but is somehow integral, I think, to the project, is because it's another one of those fraught relations of how a small nation is, is never is never just sort of in charge of its own cultural production, but it's just always in those conversations, very often implicit, sort of silent, like those lyrics from Madonna, conversations with those sort of more powerful cultural players. Um, so to sum up and to pose some questions that, that, that we might want to think about um, in our conversation, I would pose three questions to you. One would be, um, 
so how do you think your book contributes to reception studies or what can scholars of reception studies learn from it? You, you don't really engage with this framework very explicitly, but, but I bet it, it's been sort of on your mind as you're writing it. Um, my second question would be um, just sort of can, 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 can you tell us more about this entanglement of Greek cinema with, with those sort of spectral hegemonic cultural powers like the USA or, or Germany? Uh, or other European film industries. Um, and my third question would be specifically about Germany, and, and, and I think especially about this term unheimlich. Um, how can this help us think about what the weird does as a category? Is, is this sort of a Greek response to this sort of critical vocabulary that so often is dominated by those big sort of centers of cultural theory? Um, do, do you think that this can potentially be sort of a Greek response, sort of somehow a, you know, a, a term anchored in Greek studies that, that has a chance to really stay with us and also mm -hmm. beyond just Greek studies? Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, Dimitris, do you want to respond right away? Well, how <laughs> it's kind of uh, moving, you know. It's uh, one thing of being an educator. I mean, uh, you all now know it. It's that you give uh, your best, uh, and then uh, you never know when this will return, but it returns. And thank you both <laughs> <laughs> for these amazing approaches. Um, I, I didn't realize, yes, that there, uh, there was a pattern there. You're both from German studies, and uh, uh, you know, and German um, German speaking culture sometimes has been uh, um, held responsible for the Greek weird wave through the influence of people like I don't know. I mean, in different Central European anyway directors, including Haneke and others. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, exactly what happened with this book, um, which had started completely differently, uh, was that I I started exactly as you finished, uh, Carolina. Um, and I think Alexis implied this too, I didn't want to say that the weird was a category that was imposed on the Greek directors. There has been a long uh, discussion in Greece about this and in Greek studies. There are many directors that do not accept um, the, um, the, the, the appellation weird, um, actually take issue with it. This is why um, most Greek directors would prefer the new um, wave of Greek cinema. But for me, what uh, stood there important is that suddenly it was pushing me, even, even recognizing this discussion, which I do in the book, um, even trying to, un to, to disentangle for, uh, the, the, its various elements and also to take a distance from the very term, it was exactly pushing me back. For one reason, because reception, as you said, always is part of the whole game. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2011, and w uh, with a big spread in The Guardian, um, apropos the, um, on the occasion of some films by Lanthimos and Sangari and others, uh, this term, weird wave, is basically the term through which Greek cinema has been internationalized. And I think it is the most, well, the most international time of Greek cinema, you know, pretty much after the 60s. Um, um, and, 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 and suddenly you had this kind of idea of a global audience thinking of weird and of the very deconstruction of the, of the term being already in that, in, in, in that discussion already. I very much adopt this because it also uh, has given me, you know, I, I, I perform in the book an act of appropriation that I think many directors also uh, have performed in Greece. Yes, okay, weird. Let's do something with this. Uh, and it could be, um, to echo Alexis here, it could be what the Global South now uh, is teaching us, this over-appropriation of categories. Um, Chilean Argentinian cinema has uh, shown that uh, too so well. Um, and um, the fact that you never know where you stand with many of these films, and here uh, I believe we could talk um, about many films from the Global South, uh, is also part of their politics because it politicizes the viewer. Uh, so the fact that you don't know where you stand even with the term weird, even though you see it, you know, every time you, you, t you, you open a platform, if there is a Greek film, now it's always weird, no matter, no matter if it's social realists. I mean, and there have been great films. 
uh, that was the first um, the first point. The second point I wanted to bring up is um, to 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 answer but debate a little bit uh, your point. I, I mean, this kind of dialogue of outside and inside is always there, but you also uh, lose a lot. In the sense that, uh, for instance, in global reception. Uh, Normally, what you lose is the um, uh, short films, the <laughs> medium films, and a lot of, uh, <laughs> and basically you lose 85% mm -hmm. of what is produced at the local level. Um, and for me, that was also the challenge, and has always been the challenge. I know it is the challenge for um, Alexis's work, and I, know, I think of, of yours as well. Um, how do you make this relevant? You make the whole cultural production and the way cultural texts make meaning um, at a local and, and transnational level, how do you make it relevant to today's audiences? I mean, how do you, how do you engage um, in a classroom, um, in a film festival, um, in, um, in a projection room, even in a debate? Um, and that is, that is a form of dialogue that I have to, to go back and uh, rethink. You know, um, um, uh, we are always shadowed not only by the presence of the other in this dialogue, but also by the failure of the other to understand. Mm. <laughs> and to go back to the politics um, in order to respond also uh, to Alexis's points, uh, I mean, that was also very much part of the Greek crisis too, uh, which was very much shadowed by the potentials the potential for uprising, I don't know, for new thinking of alternatives, constant, and also though the potential for Orientalism, for exoticism, for a misunderstanding, also by the very other that was purportedly supportive of uh, the Greek um, community, society. Um, and this is also something when we need to rethink reception studies, and I completely appreciate this comment, we need to rethink also uh, this position of constant uh, success and failure, mm. uh, of, of, of a constant dialogue uh, between understanding and misunderstanding. And uh, to turn, um, I will uh, briefly also address uh, what you say about the Madonna lyrics in the end, because that was the part that I wanted to read, but then it was too long and also I was afraid that perhaps the audience would not be able to understand like a film they haven't seen. Um, but before that, um, you know, what Alexis said about alternative epistemologies is exactly uh, what I think we should be looking uh, for. Um, no matter, and, and of course, those of us who do cultural studies know this very well, I mean, uh, there is an intention of the cultural text, but then there's also its afterlife, and then there's also us, and us again, and us again. And uh, in that way, the epistemologies may um, come up at a later stage. Uh, it is like uh, what I used to uh, teach earlier in my life about queer literature, because always you have, you know, the occasional student who says, well, you know, yes, but can we call this queer literature, or uh, is this really meant in the text? And then you say, you know, you, you feel pressed to say the, the queer text is the child of many, many, many uh, readers, you know, uh, who take the responsibility uh, for, um, for proposing such a reading. And um, the alternative epistemology also is uh, a constant responsibility. Uh, this is how I addressed um, these um, this cultural texts. Um, and um, as Alexis, I think, made very clear, uh, these were films that affected us, um, even sometimes um, films that we didn't like and yet kept touching us in diverse um, ways. So I wanted to, um, uh, to give a sense of that as well. The book ends with 2019. Actually, two films that I watched in Athens just before lockdown. Um, one is a short film that had just won the Cannes Film Festival um, uh, for short film, The Distance Between Here and the Sky by Vasilis Kekatos. And the other is a um, feature film um, by a unsung hero, I think, of um, the weird um, way, Alexandros Vulgaris which is called Winona, and basically it's four girls uh, on a beach um, playing for a whole day, 
um, various roles. I mean, they play a film that is not there. They spend their time, they touch each other. Eventually, towards the end of the evening, uh, the, of the day, you realize they are mourning someone who is lost. And they want to mourn her, perhaps a sibling they have lost, or perhaps this is another game they play. Um, but they want to mourn her with a song by Madonna, which they cannot sing. And they say, you know, um, if we were a film, you know, we should have sung this. Mm -hmm. But then we, we wouldn't have had the copyright money. <laughs> so, so what would we have done? And there's this most moving moment for me, which is they start singing, lip singing, without many, making any sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, how weird, but also how full of meaning this is. It's haunted by what cannot be there. Uh, and indeed, that film, as I explained in the book, could be seen as, a, um, as haunted by people who are not there, people who have died. And, um, but it is also um, trying to say exactly, to open like a dialogue with all that affective experience, which even absence can bring in. And, you know, yes, I, rep I represent that in the book because I myself couldn't bring, um, and I know that very well as a, also a popular music scholar, I mean, you really cannot quote copyrighted lyrics. I mean, you spent months trying to clear copyright. Mm -hmm. So what I did with Madonna's True Blue is uh, to, 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 to just uh, mimic uh, with dots uh, the words on the page. On the page. And um, yeah, uh, that's for me how the Weird Wave kind of closes its first decade with a song that cannot be sung, but is there. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's funny because I actually, um, even before both of you brought that up, I wanted to get to that point as well. And, and it relates to a larger question that I want to ask you. Maybe two questions if we go back to the inception of, you know, conceptualizing this book and, 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 and planning it. Um, and you said uh, about that Madonna, uh, uh, and, you know, the non-singing of the Madonna lines, uh, you know, how weird. And in a way, when I read the book and when I saw those uh, dots, I had exactly that reaction. I thought, like, how weird. And there are several kind of moments in the book as we read it where I think sort of on the one hand, you, you know, you talk um, frequently about scenes where these characters and, and, and uh, you know, move in frames within frames and seem to expose something in doing so. Um, there's actually a nice German phrase, vorführen, which means both to exhibit something, to present something, but also to expose something, to expose something to ridicule or laughter even. Um, and I was wondering to a certain extent, you know, if, if, whether your writing does something similar in, in frequently when you suddenly address the reader, which seems to be something that, you know, is not what we typically do in, in academic monographs. And so, so my question was really like um, here in that sense, to, you know, can you say a little bit about what it means to write academically uh, about the, the weird? Uh, and the second and somewhat related question would be, again, about the conception of this book. It, um, that, of course, two of your previous sort of major monographs, which have had an enormous impact on the field of, of, of Greek studies and beyond, um, were written in Greek and were explicitly, I think, situated um, in, in that language and in that cultural context. So you now switched uh, uh, to English and are positioning this book uh, you know, rather differently. So maybe you can say also something about that kind of uh, mm. decision that has to do, I think, with something that came up here, namely the, the, the larger frameworks within which we think um, or have to think that conjunction of aesthetics and politics, namely, you know, something that ha does not simply have to do with um, the production of these books alone, but with a larger kind of social politicity of them that includes distribution, circulation, reception, and, and, and so on. Yeah, um, I inhabit a, a weird space anyway. I teach a small field in a very big university in an amazing big faculty where I have to have these conversations all the time. And for me, even addressing, you know, the position of Greece uh, is itself very peculiar. Um, you can use all the words you, you have used, weird, strange, uncanny, <laughs> you know, always. Um, and uh, the, the way I try to write, and I'm saying this, something here that uh, most of my colleagues will understand because, you know, of course, it's not only me who does that, um, is trying to engage also myself see my own limits in addressing 
the reader, um, a group of people that I know will be reading me, but also other potential audiences. Uh, this is why, you know, academic writing constantly puts, um, is a, a writing that has all the time a question mark, even though it is so, <laughs> you know, we appreciate it having an argument and all that, but there is always a question mark in the sense that two things, uh, how much will this argument stand, for how long, mm -hmm. uh, to whom is it being addressed, and the second thing is, um, uh, you know, who is the audience, actually? Mm -hmm. uh, how far should the audience be? And um, the Weird Wave book had to be in English, in the way that I address exactly that um, inter intertwinement of uh, non-Greek audiences and audiences, non-Greek festivals and Greek festivals in the reception and then further circulation and production of Greek films. Uh, my previous books on Cavafi um, and the Greek family had to be in Greek exactly because I had to see which audiences will be. There is a moment with the Cavafi book uh, where I had you know, a particular attack, some scholars who didn't like it, all of them, one after the other, seven reviews, mentioned uh, my preface, were, which was a very personal preface, why, why you do that, and had very intimate details. And of course they said, you know, you cannot do scholarship like that. And I knew that something was changing there. And I knew that this is why um, I had to write this in Greek. Because of course you can and you should, in a way, uh, you, you may be able to, but also in many ways I think I should be doing it that way. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, we come back to this idea that our address to the other and the <coughs> address as writers to the reader is already weird anyway. Mm -hmm. And the answers we give um, are complex and then demand new uh, ways of uh, uh, finding the question. <laughs> so that's the... Um, yeah, that, was there another question that I forgot? No, no, okay. I think I, I would have, <coughs> excuse me, one more um, question which also has to do with what, what um, Carolina said about this kind of um, <coughs> um, global context and, and predicament. And that's um, something that I found interesting is that you, you talk about global crisis in a way, about a global social historical moment, but... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Something that is notably absent uh, from the book and from discussions in modern Greek studies, it seems to me in particular, uh, 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 as well, is the question of something that we might want to call the eco-critical. I mean, this whole kind of discourse of the Anthropocene, etc., etc., is something that is that is not really here. Um, yeah. <coughs> that does not have to fully. It seem, it seem to have fully made it into Greek studies. And um, do you want to comment on that? Is that? Yeah, I mean, that's completely, I, I have also um, seen um, this comment um, in, in our conversation on email, and you are absolutely right. And um, I'm trying to formulate, well, if there is a second volume of this, that will be called Biopolitical Realism. Mm -hmm. And I cannot not think of uh, the eco-critical uh, moment also present in recent Greek thinking about uh, the global moment, uh, but also, of course, um, elsewhere. I mean, Latin American film is more open to these questions. Um, <coughs> but I have to say that the big um, success story of uh, this year's Greek cinema, um, a Western, a uh, Greek Western called Digger, is exactly, you can see there, the moment that the weird turns eco-critical. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, um, uh, yeah, um, an eco like ecological film uh, that I find very interesting. Um, so um, yes, and yes, it's not a very present, neither in discussions about the weird wave, not very present in my book, but um, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we can um, now turn to questions from the audience. Um, but I just wanted to say that I, I look forward to volume two. Um, so I hope <laughs> By that political you, realism. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I hope I, my <laughs> publishers do so. I think they do. <laughs> I, th I think they'll go for it. Um, so I have one uh, question that I received from the audience, and that's what direction do you think 
Greek weird or the Greek new wave cinema might take next? Yeah, as, um, as I said just now, you know, questions about the global um, may be now um, what um, will be very much in the center of, the, of Greek cinema. Um, also a certain irony towards that weird decade, um, towards that particular, it's now a little bit in the past, that weird moment, also the discussion, but also still with us. Um, for me, the most um, fascinating uh, kind of new directions uh, have to do with the way the uh, recent uh, new wave of Greek cinema, including films that um, we watch now, uh, are turning us to the past, mm. um, and turning us to, re uh, turning us to reappreciate uh, a whole century of Greek cinema, mm -hmm. and also Greek cinema within a global uh, or a transnational uh, context. <coughs> this, for me, is a, a certain turn to archive. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it archive trouble sometimes. Uh, precise, and I can see it also in the cinema. The um, last the thing I want to also mention is the extreme um, resourcefulness of Greek directors. <coughs> you find uh, so many young Greek directors, especially those um, making now, at the moment, short and medium length films, uh, going to ex exactly very fascinating uh, discussions. And um, one is the gender and, uh, and, and citizenship in Greece and in Europe. Another is the, the kind of politics of form. Um, another is the eco-critical turn. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot to uh, a lot to come from Greek cinema. I'm pretty pretty sure. Okay. So I have another question. Um, so it's about the term weird and and its specificity. Um, Tim, uh, Morton, Tim, is it Tim Morton, who makes the t the weird a key concept in what's uh, dark ecology. Uh, talks about, quote, becoming accustomed to something strange or uh, that doesn't become less strange through acclimation. So do you think that that's the case of the weird that you are looking for, you are looking at? Yeah, it could um, and may not. I mean, uh, certainly um, I can see how we can think of it that way. Mm. I have here to admit <laughs> that my own version of... Um, uh, kind of this weird realism uh, comes from a completely different set of uh, texts and also films. Um, but uh, have, uh, I don't know if you have seen The Truman Show, but The Truman Show, I, I think most of us have seen it. There's a moment in uh, this guy who has lived all his life in a studio, cared for, but also having to, 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 to act for it uh, without knowing it. Somehow at, there's a moment where he starts recognizing the whole game and starts going for the set, going to, to find out what is there next. Mm -hmm. But what is there next is the moment he touches this, uh, the set, he starts realizing that you know th he has to now negotiate what is out there, the directors of this kind of system. Um, this is the moment of weird realism. Mm -hmm. You're still in, but you somehow know the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that is exactly the... Um, where deep ecology is coming from, but I'm sure that the realization moment, it's always a weird realization, mm. is uh, uh, what connects them. That's awesome. I, I, there's another question, also on the weird. Um, the weird is linked with, with fate, a teleology, uh, yet grew to capture um, disorientation, rupture of normalized context, an open future. And how would you relate weirdness in the cinema to futurity? Yeah, that's, um, that's something that um, I, I very much try also to discuss with colleagues. I know there are colleagues who precisely work on this. Uh, it is precisely because the weird uh, pushes you. And now we are talking about the weird as we use it here as a dynamic term, mm. uh, reclaimed term. Uh, it's precisely because the weird and the weird moment pushes you to find different epistemologies mm -hmm. of the present that mm. it talks to the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking also in the terms of what you were talking about, the different potentials of the weird. 
you say, you know, and, and how if we read these films in any way as allegorizing or as being parallel to a crisis, to a financial crisis, for example, and um, you're talking about, then you, you mentioned the, you know, there's potential for revolution, there's the a, a potential for uprising, but there's also the potential for exoticism. And I'm just wondering also how these films, this made me think how these films kind of fit very well into the moment, this moment of reception, which is where reception has sort of exploded because we have, <laughs> we have reception through Twitter, we have reception through academic writing, we have reception of academics in Twitter. So I, I was wondering how, how you think, you know, um, the weird or, 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 or whatever this movement is, is transformed by this kind of mediatic moment. Yeah, and, and, and we have to also see how it is transformed now after two years of lockdowns, mm. when it, it became for a second time very much sought after, you know, wherever you, you had a selection of films, especially now short films became very much in demand because, mm. you know, uh, Greeks knew a little bit about biopolitics and uh, they had um, gone there as well as many others, of course. Um, now, the, yeah, the point about uh, exoticization or, uh, you know, basically getting it, um, you know, becoming commonplace is, mm -hmm. is, 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 is something interesting. Uh, supposedly, the very idea of weirdness is what wakes you up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of, uh, that was for me, um, you know, the weird wave in many, uh, in many ways has woken us up in modern Greek studies as well to the contemporary moment to speak differently. Mm -hmm. And that was also, you might have seen, and this is something I, I thank you so much for being so kind. You didn't mention it, but you know, one uh, possible criticism of the book, um, which I knew in advance, is that it's not very um, comparative. I mean, it doesn't give you other films constantly that you can compare these films to. But that was my position. I had to start mm -hmm. from the local discussion and its politicization, um, and I had to find the terms in which that then speaks mm -hmm. uh, to an international context. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been so much easier to say, you know, okay, take this film and the other film, and this looks, these Lanthimos films uh, look like this, mm -hmm. these Kutras films, you know, are new queer films that look like uh, the other. Mm -hmm. I tried to find the specificity in order exactly to find the, the theoretical terms that would allow me to open a dialogue. Oh. I have one last question. Uh? That's a good one. <laughs> uh, what role does humor play in the Greek weird wave? How is a joke conceived of, and why is it funny and noticeably different from the rest? Surreal dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> this is great because uh, some people uh, see the whole thing as a joke. Mm -hmm. But again, if you read the book, you will see that I, I try to say, OK, you need to see the, how diverse the films are. Not all of them are funny. Uh, but yeah, the moment of humor and trying to locate it um, exactly comes to this politics of response mm -hmm. um, and reception. Uh, you really need to take a stance when you laugh. Mm -hmm. You are a political viewer then. Yeah. And that's, and that's, very, that's very significant. And I'm, I'm, I think this is a good point at which to end. I would like to thank um, Alexis, Carolina, but also Dimitris for being here today. Uh, this has been a really fascinating dis uh, discussion, so I'm, 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 I'm so glad to have been part of it. Um, and I would like to thank you, the audience, for joining us online. Um, uh, as, as I said, this is Torch's um, flagship uh, and fortnightly event, Book at Lunchtime, and we would love to welcome you again in two weeks' time for the um, Book at Lunchtime, which uh, will focus on the Oxford Handbook of Dante. So now I would like to thank everybody, and thank you very much again, and see you soon. <laughs>